Okay. Okay, let's start. Good morning, afternoon, evening. Hola, hello, bonjour, hola. Ni hao, konnichiwa, annyeonghaseyo. And hello all. Welcome and thank you, Simbis people, for joining us the 74 seminar, 74 seminar, and I call it a National Center of Biotechnology, Madrid Day. Like last year, when I traveled for more than 160 days, this year again, I will be traveling for more than, I think, 130 days or more. And I'm so excited to take my first international flight this year in a few days to visit four German Institute, University of Oxford, Imperial College, and ETH Switzerland. I started my trip during the pandemic, summer 2021, to meet and reconnect with people because we lost many people due to COVID, but at the same time, we also lost the important human connection. Since 2021, and I believe I have given more than 130 presentations, thanks to many people who invite me, including today's pioneer speaker, and I will continue to do so. Let's connect and meet in person. So, okay, it's my tremendous honor to introduce very briefly our pioneer speaker, Professor Victor Delorangio. In fact, I mean, he doesn't need any introduction because we all know him. He is a professor at National Center of Biotechnology, Madrid, Spain, where I visited last summer. I enjoyed too much last summer uh, in Spain, even with my wife. He is a pioneer and leader in bacterial research, especially soil bacteria, including Pseudomonas species. He is also a great mentor. This year, his mentee, Pavel Dvorak, received J. Bailey Young Investigate Award, one of the most pre prestigious, I mean, award in metabolic engineering, which you know, will be presented at Metabolic Engineering 15 conference that I'm also co-chairing. Victor, I'm truly thank you for your time and for your contribution to scientific society. I'm a huge contribution, especially by supporting young generations education and the virtual podium is all yours. And thank you again. Okay, well, um, thank you, Taiseok. I'm, I'm very overwhelmed by your very benevolent and friendly introduction. Um, and let me just tell you first that uh, you should be congratulated for having led this initiative of having uh, this whole seminar series where you combine more veteran people with uh, emerging um, uh, scientists. And it is a fantastic opportunity for the different generations to come together and to uh, have a fruitful conversation. I'm also very excited in particular to be um, the kind of a warm up um, introduction to our real um, speaker today, who is uh, uh, Dr. Park. And um, I'm satisfied because, in fact, I have followed his work with tremendous admiration. And in my opinion, he's one of the most creative synthetic biologists at the moment. And I'm sure that he will have ahead of him a very, very bright career. So once said that, let me share with you a bit of my own history and how I became involved in synthetic biology. So obviously I was around before modern synthetic biology uh, was born. And by that time, uh, I was interested much before the times of synthetic biology, I was very interested in using uh, environmental bacteria as agents for environmental bioremediation. And I have to say that today it is taken for granted that we have a big environmental problem, climatic change and everything. But in the late 70s of last century, 
and early 2000s and early to, and, and early 1990s, no one was really concerned about that. So it was only by the mid of the 1980s of the last century that what you may call the green awareness started to grow, partly because of some major environmental accidents that happened during that period of time. Just to mention two that were really devastating was the um, uh, Exxon Valdez spill in, in the coasts of Alaska that created a tremendous say, impact in the ecosystems of that time. And televisions were packed with um, uh, petroleum spills and animals and all types of disastrous images. And then the other one that really raised the awareness that we had a big problem was uh, this leak of toxic substances in Bhopal in India. So um, that happened uh, during a period of time of, of the 80s and so, and that increased the, what you may call the um, a green awareness of the society. And by that time, just by coincidence, it was the time of the big development and the big birth of recombinant DNA technology. And therefore many scientists thought, well, maybe we can combine advanced genetic technologies for doing something good for the environment. And I was fortunate to find an excellent laboratory led by that time by Ken Timmis that was pioneered exactly the idea of bringing genetic technologies and recombinant DNA methods to improve bacteria for environmental remediation. What happened during that period of time was scientifically amazing, but in terms of actual applications, we didn't get very far simply because we were a bit naive and we did not have the tools and the knowledge and the background that we have today to really tackle big environmental problems. But the whole situation changed early in the 2000s with the onset of what now we call synthetic biology, because it provided a new conceptual frame to really readdress topics that could not be addressed otherwise, because it provided a large number of genetic tools, a large number of conceptual frames, modeling tools, computation, uh, circuits, you name it. And therefore, I would say that to me, uh, my participation in synthetic biology has been an amazing experience simply because it has allowed me to return to topics that were virtually abandoned by many other people because they thought that some of the problems connected to the environment were impossible to trace. But now, thanks to synthetic biology, we can return to them with a new spirit, new energy, and new concepts. So I am really happy to be uh, in this field, in this community. And also I see that there's a new generation of scientists like Jung Jung that are taking environmental issues very seriously in combining a solid scientific background, a solid research program with this big vision that synthetic biology would be one of the major players to make our society, our economy and our world more sustainable. And in that respect, I believe that synthetic biology will be one of the major tools, one of the major instruments, one of the a few allies that we have as a planet, as a planet, as a, as a global society, to really tackle the big phenomenal problems that we have created because of our industrial and urban development. So this is all I wanted to share with you today. And I am just happy to uh, be the uh, warm up, uh, say, introduction to a real speaker today, that is Dr. Park. Thank you very much. Absolutely wonderful talk, and I'm 100% agree with you. I mean, that is very great overview of history of our field, and then you are living legendary in this field, I guess. <laughs> so uh, that's that I completely agree with you. I mean, the, we have the many global issue, but now I a little bit more more optimistic because we have synthetic biology tools at the same time young researcher try to solve those kind of problem every day so i hope i mean and i believe we will solve the problem you know in the future and we should as well so thank you thank you that's very inspiring and thank you so much for your wonderful talk thank you thank you okay so now the main speaker of today with a, a little bit longer introduction. Professor Jun Young Ba is an assistant professor of chemical and biomolecular engineering and also co-director of the Metabolomics Center at UCLA, Los Angeles. 
His research group is interested in systems biology and metabolic engineering. He aims to elucidate metabolic regulation in microbes for efficient bioproduct synthesis, as well as cancer and immune cells for therapeutic discovery by employing LCMS and isotope tracing. His recent awards include NIH Maximizing Investigators Research Award, so-called MIRA, and one of the most competitive NIH grants, and Hellman Fellowship and UCLA Faculty Career Development Award. Before moving to Los Angeles, he conducted postdoctoral research at MIT. He received his bachelor's degree in mathematics and bioengineering from UC San Diego and master's and PhD in chemical engineering from Princeton University. And also today I just heard Junyoung is not in LA, but right now in Korea. That means right now his time is around midnight, but past midnight. And so I especially thank Junyoung for his time. And this is actually a bad time for him <laughs> today. And I'm also excited to listen to you know, his talk and your talk. And please take it away. And it is all yours now. Thank you. Thank you for the great introduction, Taesuk. And Thank you for the prelude, uh, Victor. Uh, it's great to learn the history of synthetic biology. Let me share my screen. Let's see. Okay. So I hope everyone can see my screen, uh, the yes. slides. Okay, that's great. Oops. Okay, yeah, thank you. As Taesok mentioned, I am in South Korea and it's a little past midnight. So good morning, good, ap good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. Uh, today, I'll be talking about my research uh, from as a trainee and as an independent researcher. And we, uh, I go all the way from the fundamental aspects of metabolism, and I aim to uh, use the new knowledge that I gained from studying metabolism into engineering it. So one of the problems that I'm greatly interested in is uh, CO2 utilization, and it benefits the environment. Uh, it also is a great way to produce chemical feedstocks and biofuels, so it uh, has many benefits in multiple industries. And I, when I started my uh, postdoc, I was looking at different ways of converting CO2, and I'm not, I'm uh, by no means an expert in any of these areas compared to uh, many others. But I've looked at photosynthesis, electrochemical methods, and non-photosynthetic methods that I was introduced to as a postdoc. And they all have they all seem to have some sort of a trade-off where as the rate increases, you make less valuable product. And when you make more valuable product, the rate of production decreases. And um, I, I believe the photosynthesis here um, is kind of the slower uh, of the three approaches, but uh, it can produce many valuable products. And I, you know, and I think there's some challenges associated with it that I'm not working on, but other people are working on. So one of the methods, uh, one of the ways to tackle this challenge is how can you make it scalable? Because photosynthesis depends on the surface area that's exposed to sunlight or some sort of light. And it's not, the sunlight is not always available. It's only available during the day and nice days. And electrochemical methods, it's very fast. Um, but at the same time, it's got some, its own challenges. It's got uh, pro uh, challenges with selectivity and also making advanced products. And non-photosynthesis, um, I was skeptical at the very beginning, and I, I will get to this uh, in the later, later part of my talk. It's actually very fast. Um, it's, I think, comparable to electrochemical methods. Um, and in some ways, it could exceed if it's producing a little more complex products. But the problem with non photosynthetic approach of CO2 utilization, and this is a biological way, is that it requires a little more complex nutrients for it to behave well. So uh, that's the 
main motivation. And in this talk, I'd like to go through uh, basically my version of uh, explaining what metabolism is. And I'd like to use that understanding of metabolism in converting CO2 into advanced bioproducts. And these are based on my uh, work as a trainee and as an independent researcher. And these have been published in uh, great journals. So first part is uh, answering this question of what is metabolism? As everyone knows, metabolism is a process in our body that converts uh, nutrients into uh, more cells. And you know, if you're a young person, then your body grows. So you, know, you make more cells and your body uh, weight increases. And as a byproduct, you basically make CO2 and heat. And this process repeat, uh, is replicated in basically every single cell in our body. And this is also conserved in microbes. Uh, it's conserved across diverse uh, divergent organisms. So microbes have more complex metabolism in terms of biosynthesis. And then mammal, mammals also have pretty uh, conserved central carbon metabolism. So um, this is a short version of metabolic network. This is um, this is just showing a combination of plant and microbes and human metabolism into just a single picture. And in, in the late uh, 1990s and early 2000s, with the genome sequences being available in more and more organisms, researchers have been able to build this sort of genome scale metabolic models, where if you zoom in, you, you basically see all the uh, reactions catalyzed by these enzymes, and then they have substrate and products, uh, and then they're all linked by these arrows. And engineers have also successfully converted these maps into a single matrix called a stoichiometric matrix. So this allowed us to actually study the whole metabolic network in a very simple linear algebraic way. And starting from this uh, basis, basic metabolic pathway map, scientists have also asked questions such as what controls metabolic concentrations in the cell and what controls the amount of enzymes, proteins in the cell. And ultimately, these come together to catalyze biological reactions, so it controls biological metabolic fluxes. And as an engineer, I think all these problems are interesting. And I thought there's one more last question for us to answer. That's, can we control metabolism knowing these regulatory principles that exist in nature? So um, as a, a PhD student, one of the most exciting work that I had done was to start answering the first question, which is what controls metabolite concentrations? So that began with me measuring uh, about 100 metabolite, uh, 100 uh, epsilon metabolite concentrations in three divergent organisms. So we had a mammalian cell, uh, cell line, yeast, and E. coli cells. And we saw that despite them having very different uh, genome sizes and having uh, very, very far away in the um, evolutionary tree, they have a pretty similar metabol metabolic metabolome. Uh, so you can see that glutamate is the most abundant. Amino acid is the most abundant class of metabolites. And um, you know, if you look at the coefficient of deter uh, yeah coefficient of determination, you actually see a pretty high conservation. So this was an ex exciting discovery, and we also were able to deduce that these metabolomes were so consistent across all these organisms because they try to satisfy these two kind of global uh, constraints. One, biological organisms have organi uh, evolved to utilize enzymes efficiently. And to do that, they had to use uh, enzymes. They have to occupy a lot of the active sites of the enzymes with substrates, because if they're left unoccupied, then the enzymes have, are not being used, and they're not efficiently using these proteins, which are costly to the cells. At the same time, they have to leave these uh, regulatory sites, especially these inhibitor binding sites, open. So because metabolites act as both substrates, products, and also inhibitors and regulators, uh, effectors. So they have these kind of global constraints where you have to, um, you know, you have to have substrate concentration greater than KM, Michaelis constant, and less than uh, the inhibitor binding uh, 
constant. There's also another kind of constraint, which is the thermodynamic constraint, where we want the reactions to happen in a favorable direction where cells utilize the nutrients and then synthesize biomass precursors. So there's also these thermodynamic uh, constraint where they have to uh, maintain the negative free energy of reaction across all reactions that cells uh, use to uh, re replicate. So I consider kind of the first question a little more uh, under control. Now, the second and third question, which are more troublesome, it's because metabolic fluxes are not something that we can measure directly. These metabolites are uh, basically like traffic flow. Uh, you, cannot, you can kind of count the number of cars that pass certain, uh, let's say certain line in a, on a road, but you, it's, it's very difficult to measure compared to just counting the number of cars in just a single region, for example. So I have this kind of um, uh, resemblance between traffic and then also metabolic fluxes where metabolites and vehicles are the entities that we're, we can measure readily. And then these are controlled by these enzymes and uh, concentrations or traffic lights and then the traffic uh, on the road. And you know, you know, they have the, these purposes in metabolism. Cells try to convert substrates into useful products in an efficient manner. In a traffic, someone tries to get from point A to point B in an efficient way. So in, uh, so in trying to measure these fluxes, uh, the scientists and, and engineers in the field have uh, utilized isotope tracers. And isotope tracers basically allow us to visualize metabolism in action. And I have this kind of a picture where, you know, let's imagine that you're trying to actually now measure the rate of the water flowing in two uh, streams of water. You can dye one uh, side yellow, the other side blue. And when they converge, they're going to have a color somewhere in between. And depending on what color it is, you can actually figure out what's the greater contributor to that uh, merging point. So if it's closer to blue with green, um, then pathway B, for example, has a greater uh, contribution. So this is actually a, an image, uh, actually a yeah, moving uh, image that I found online a few years ago, and I forget where it is exactly, but it's hard to guess. I think it's the Yellow River in China. You can kind of see the, the muddy river and then the clean river merging. And then at this point, you're going to have some kind of color. And then based on this, you can actually, uh, you can actually uh, infer how much water is coming from the relative ratio of the water coming from each stream. So I think this is a pretty uh, neat way. The only problem is that we cannot really have some kind of colors on the, uh, we cannot have really colors on the molecules, small molecules. So the method that we use is uh, LCMS to basically tag molecules with different number of neutrons. Um, and based on how heavy uh, the metabolites are when you, when they converge on a uh, confluent point, we can figure out uh, what the contribution of two or more streams uh, is. So we routinely utilize 13C and sometimes five, uh, uh, sometimes deuterium and 15N, but these can be measured using a powerful mass spectrometer. We use most commonly orbit trap, which allows us to measure, you know, essentially a limited number of ions at, a, at a, any given time. So we use LC to chemically separate the complex cellular analytes, and then we use MS to identify metabolites and then also measure how much uh, isotopic enrichment there is. And these are stable isotopes, so these are completely safe, and um, only at really high concentrations or enrichments of deuterium cells have some sort of uh, toxicity. But these are, in general, doesn't, doesn't really affect metabolism at all, and allows, it allows us to visualize what's going on. So. Uh, what is our current understanding of metabolism? And in my opinion, it's a fascinating thing because I, I feel like the progress in biology sometimes seems very slow compared to other, other uh, fields of science. So this example is uh, glycolysis, which is the first and the best studied 
metabolic pathway. So glycolysis was first discovered by Louis Pasteur, who found out that fermentation occurs because of microbes, uh, their presence in, uh, in grape juice. Uh, and several decades later, without knowing the full uh, biochemical interconversions that happen in glycolysis, Otto Warburg uh, reported that uh, aerobic glycolysis, which is uh, increased production of lactate, even in the presence of oxygen in cancer cells, is a common uh, kind of a hallmark of cancer. And then another couple of decades later, Emden and Myroff and others have found uh, and they completed basically all the steps of glycolysis. And only in the uh, late 1900s, um, people have started appreciating that there's a lot of regulation going on. And, you know, these are all, you know, these central carbon metabolic pathways are involved in a lot of different diseases. So over the past uh, several decades, you can kind of see even this uh, simple glycolytic pathway that we learn in our biochemistry textbook it's gaining more and more traction in the research field because first it's, it's it's the most central metabolic pathway, I would argue, and people are finding that it's involved in many, many uh, diseases uh, too. So, uh, but the thing is, when you look into a little more details, more than just the biochemical reaction steps, reaction mechanisms, there's very little known about the rates and the energies related to this uh, glycolysis. So. One example is this, uh, one prime example of that is this uh, table in a really commonly used biochemistry textbook where they show, uh, oops, sorry, where they show Gibbs free energy of reaction across all the steps of glycolysis. And we know from the second law of thermodynamics that if uh, reaction happens it's spontaneously, then it has to be less than negative, uh, less than zero, I mean, it has to be less than zero. But we see that, you know, there, there are a couple of reactions that are that have positive delta G. So uh, this cannot be representing the glycolysis in cells that are alive. But basically, you know, we have these quantities that are not reliable that are being taught in school. So um, so uh, throughout the last uh, couple of years and in, in my current lab, we've I've been studying glycolysis actively and we're still learning about how glycolysis is controlled. Uh, a close colleague of mine, Lucas Tanner, here um, published a paper in 2019 uh, that in mammalian glycolysis, you can express basically these uh, three or four steps basically in glycolysis, and you can exert 100% of glycolytic control. So it doesn't matter whether the these intermediate steps are overexpressed or not, but the only thing that matters when you try to increase glycolytic flux is just increasing these fluxes through this yellow highlighted region. And I had some uh, follow-up work where I looked at the near equilibrium steps of glycolysis. So I call that thermodynamic bottlenecks because when they're closer to equilibrium, they don't really have a thermodynamic driving force to uh, push the reaction forward. Um, so these gray regions are typically uh, closer to equilibrium than these yellow regions. And I found that these um, thermodynamically uh, non forward driving reactions, they actually tend to um, adapt very leniently, uh, adapt to the changing environments uh, without having to express all the extra uh, enzymes. So basically, uh, if, for example, cells encounter uh, hypoxic environment, or if they have some kind of ATP inhibitor, ATP synthase inhibitor, for example, then they try to uh, compensate for the lost ATP synthesis by increasing glycolytic flux. And then they can do that really quickly if they have these kind of uh, adaptive reactions that, that can um, shift forward and backward uh, easily. And in, oops, sorry about that. And in my current lab, that we're we're now studying a parallel glycolytic pathway called the ED pathway. Um, and in a dynamic environment, we're finding that even though this pathway carries very little flux, it actually accelerates much faster than the typical um, textbook glycolysis. So basically, by 
having this seemingly redundant, unnecessary pathway that kind of goes parallel to glycolysis that we know of. Um, even if, even though it's not useful most of the times when the environment changes, cells can upshift this red part of the, uh, the parallel glycolysis very fast and it allows cells to adapt to the new environment uh, in a much faster um, manner. So these are kind of the fundamental aspects of glycolysis that I've been interested in. And we have some parallel work going on in uh, immune cells and um, in cancer cell lines. So we hope to share these with you soon. Uh, in the meantime, now using this kind of fundamental understanding of how metabolic pathways can be controlled, uh, I wanted to see how we can convert carbon dioxide into something useful so that this whole process is economical. And I thought doing this all in one organism would be very challenging because going from CO2 to any of these complex products would take a couple dozen steps at least. And the metabolic rewiring that has to be done for any single organism is, is tremendous. So we decided to break this down into two simpler problems. First, converting CO2 into acetate, and then converting in another state stage, uh, we convert acetate into some other uh, more advanced byproduct. So now um, I wanted to go back to kind of the whole metabolism before we begin this process. So we know that metabolism in microbes uh, plays a major role in producing biomass, meaning growth. So that, that requires actually pretty complex uh, integration of multiple types of elements. So carbon is the, the backbone, so carbon is in the center. And then if you feed organic carbons, it's got electrons and you can also make some intermediates. And then there you can use um, oxygen and phosphate and nitrogen and phosphate and so forth to make these energy and biomass precursors to support growth. But this is not exactly we, what we need because we want the cells to produce something other than themselves. So we wanted to simplify this by removing all these kind of side reactions, oxygen phosphate, nitrogen phosphate. Let's just focus on the energy and the carbon backbones. So this is what I did. Uh, we converted a complex metabolic pathways into just two simple net reactions that we wanted to focus on. That is converting carbon dioxide to carbon dioxide and uh, using the electrons to make acetate, and then using acetate and use the fatty acid biosynthesis pathway that uses energy, uh, cellular energy currency, ATP, and more reducing power, NADPH, to make some uh, palmitate, which is uh, bio biofuel. Uh, so uh, instead of directly feeding electricity to the cells, we also fed hydrogen because you know it's easy to um, Hydrogen, I think, is now becoming more and more tractable as an energy source and energy carrier. So, um, so the idea is that now we know this stoichiometric constraints. We know that some carbon, some electrons, uh, or NADPH, or some ATP, these are required in certain ratios. So if you have any excess in any one of them, it's not going to actually lead to high product concentration. So what we wanted to uh, accomplish is to boost the production of all three components. And then that, you know, if we do that proportionally, that meets this uh, stoichiometric reaction that I showed, then we can boost the product synthesis greatly. And I was working on an organism called Marilla thermocytica that at the time had a very, very finicky uh, uh, genetic uh, tools, so it didn't. It wasn't a great option for me to sp spend a lot of time uh, engineering the, its genome or try, just even trying to introduce plasmids. And I wasn't a great synthetic biologist at the time, so I didn't really uh, also use uh, a lot of the available genetic tools in another organism, Eravia lipolytica. So I resorted resorted to basically using the simplest ways of rewiring metabolism, which is changing the nutrients. Um, so before going there, I had to realize what's going on in metabolism 
And this is the, the reductive acetyl-CoA pathway, which uh, non-photosynthetic non organisms used to fix carbon dioxide. It has a methyl branch, it has the carbonyl branch, and it uses an ATP to go through the methyl branch. And then it generates ATP when it produces acetate and secretes it. So it's an ATP neutral process. But these electrons, in the process of making these, they can they can use some kind of chemiosmotic uh, 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 energies to basically turn ATP synthase. Um, so they actually produce just a little bit of ATP, not quite one. Um, so we figured that cells, if they're to try to manage growth and production of acetate, they'll be ATP limited. And we figured glycolysis, so we just talked about how glycolysis uh, is the central pathway in a lot of the divergent organisms. <clears throat> we figured that glucose being an efficient ATP producer, we could hopefully couple these two so that glucose focuses on making ATP and then this reductive acetyl-CoA pathway you know, focuses on not producing ATP, but just reducing carbons into acetate. So that, that's what we try to accomplish. So um, we decided to just feed a tiny bit of glucose, ba basically drip by drip, um, so that hydrogen provides the majority of the energy source, more than 90%, uh, and then glucose provides less than 10% of the energy, and then you know see what happens. So to figure out what happens in metabolism, uh, again, we used 13C isotope tracer and mass spectrometry to figure out where the 13C goes. So what we did was we fed uh, 13C labeled glucose and unlabeled natural CO2. And based, based on how much 13C we observed in these molecules and the relevant pathways of glycolysis and the reductive acetyl CoA pathway, you can figure out where the carbons go from glucose, where the carbon from CO2 goes. And then this red here shows actually that glucose carbon is pretty confined to just glycolysis. It doesn't even go so far as pyruvate. It just stops at basically PEP. And in this process, they basically make uh, ATP. And then they also produce some um, tough to produce uh, biomass precursors, such as nu nucleotides and aromatic amino acids. And we saw that CO2 basically taking over the majority of the uh, reductive acetyl-CoA pathway and um, the acetate production, as well as partial TC cycle. So by doing that, um, we were able to accomplish a very fast CO2 fixation, which I think is uh, comparable. So with this high CO2 production, the majority of it went to producing acetate, actually. So with this high acetate production, this is actually pretty comparable to how fast yeast makes ethanol. So we're actually pretty thrilled about this because I never really expected the biological system to be so, so fast. Then what's amazing is what's amazing is that we are using so little glucose. So basically, at this regime, we are producing tons and tons of acetate per gram of glucose that we feed. So now that we have uh, CO two going into acetate happening pretty fast, um, we wanted to see what we can make. And one of the things is fuels. And I'm gonna just talk about briefly what's what we're making the other realm. Um, so we decided to basically have two stages where Marilla Thermosirica that I was talking about in the previous several slides produces acetate from CO2 and hydrogen, and it's just a tiny bit of glucose. And we feed acetate into another organism, Eurovia lipolitica, which is a uh, it's great uh, lipogenesis. It's great at lipogenesis, and it stores lipids in the cell and can basically fill 90% of its cell volume by, with lipids. So it's a great host organism for making uh, advanced byproducts. So similarly um, to the previous slide where we co-fed glucose and CO2 and hydrogen, here we co-fed gluconate and acetate because we, uh, we reasoned that cells, uh, when acetate is the main carbon source, would have a trouble making NADPH. And the, uh, the uh, result of that was basically us boosting the production of these three precursors to lipids. And we did 13C uh, MFA, metabolic flux analysis, where we figured out that 
these the gluconate and acetate, these two carbon sources have basically partitioned role Glu gluconate states within upper glycolysis and the pentose phosphate pathway to turn this pentose hexose cycle and recursively generating NADPH. So it's almost maximizing NADPH production. Um, and then acetate, it's producing, uh, it's turning into acetylcholine, which is the starting point for lipogenesis. And it's, uh, some of it is diverted into the TCA cycle where it's uh, producing ATP. So by doing this, cells were able to actually produce the triacylglyceride um, at a really fast rate. And um, the amount of gluconate that we needed to feed was tiny, less than 10%. So, the, so now we have these two organisms that are able to first convert CO2 into acetate really fast. And then now we have this ERV lipolytica, which can convert acetate into lipids really fast. We figured out uh, how these two can work so well, these two um, organisms can work so well under multiple substrates. So we, we try to actually see what's going on by looking at glucose-only condition and hydrogen-only condition for Morella thermocytica. And then we're just linearly combining the fraction of energy that's provided to the cells uh, in our uh, mixed substrate cases. And then we basically expected to see something that's somewhat uh, better than gas-only condition, but uh, not as good as glucose only condition in terms of making acetate. But we actually, what we observed is several fold higher than that. And similarly with Eurovia, when they're fed gluconate only or acetate only, um, because we didn't uh, replace acetate with gluconate, we actually fed uh, gluconate on top of the acetate that's in batch. We expected something that's slightly higher than just acetate only condition because we provided such tiny amounts of gluconate. But what we observed is Again, something like 30% more in terms of um, lipid production. So uh, scientifically, what we learned is that if we pick the right pairs of substrates, we can uh, achieve synergy, where what we observe is better than the sum of the individual components uh, when they're provided separately. And this also allows us to kind of be a little bit lazy uh, in the synthetic biology realm. Uh, we, we can get away with fewer genetic modifications. And biotechnologically, this is relevant because we're making complex molecules uh, using carbon dioxide. And then I'm going to show you soon, but hydrogen is a very cost-effective energy source compared to glucose. Um, and we're producing uh, lipids and acetate at a substantial rate that's pretty close to how fast yeast makes ethanol, so it's industrially relevant. So now uh, I wanted to get to this question of the economics because in the first slide I showed you that um, there seems to be trade-offs between the rate of product synthesis and then the value of the product. So let's go back to the very beginning where we co-feed glucose and hydrogen and CO2. And the greatest yield that we observed in Morella thermocytica was 80 grams of acetate produced per gram of glucose. So it seems like a magic. Uh, the rest comes from CO2. And then when we feed this 80 grams of acetate to Yervia, we generate uh, about 13 grams of lipids. Still, it's 13-fold higher than uh, the initial substrate uh, level glucose. So it seems possible that we can create value in terms of energy, not just uh, mass. If you start with 100 units of energy that's stored in hydrogen, we can actually capture half of it in the final Yervia lipolytica oleaginous yeast strain as uh, about a third being biomass and then the two thirds being uh, triacylglycerol. So it seems that um, we are preserving much of the energy in high value products. And we did some cost uh, analysis. So this cost of lipids that we produce based on how much uh, energy comes from hydrogen versus uh, glucose it obviously uh, decreases if hydrogen cost is cheaper as, as we go right. Uh, here I assumed one gram per kilogram for hydrogen, and we're not quite there yet, but depending on some sources, we can get there. Um, and then you can see how much lipids would have to, how much the lipid has to be 
basically if the hydrogen cost were $1 per kilogram. Uh, if you're given also opportunity to uh, sell the biomass that's created using yeast, which is a generally safe organism, then we can, if we also get CO2 credit, actually our uh, cost curve drops further if we go far into the right, uh, where we use mainly hydrogen for energy source. And this dotted line is basically the cost of diesel. And I think if we have the right environment and then the basically this region where we pick the ratio of the hydrogen and glucose as the energy source, I think we can actually start making profit from doing running this process. So hopefully this is something that we can do in the future. In the meantime, uh, another way to make this economic calculation easy is by making something more valuable. So one of the things is esteric acid, which is a terpenoid that inhibits branched chain amino acid biosynthesis. This is a molecule that our collaborator, Yi Tang at UCLA, found in uh, their 2018 paper. So this molecule, esteric acid, blocks uh, this dihydroxy acid dehydratase um, and uh, blocks uh, branched chain amino acid synthesis only in plants, and humans don't have this. So it's a, it's a promising herbicide. So you basically add a little bit of um, um, esteric acid, and then the plants don't grow. And we're currently working on uh, introducing these biosynthetic genes that's identified in the 2018 paper by the Tang Lab. Um, this is just following the famous mevalonate pathway and just fo uh, following the farnesyl uh, pyrophosphate. We can add three enzyme steps to produce uh, esteric acid. So this is something we are working on. We actually have some interesting finding um, that um, these there seems to be some diversion of pharmaceutical pyrophosphate into some interesting uh, products that no one has uh, really discovered um, in Eurovilla Politica. So we're trying to write about this soon. And another kind of collaboration that we got involved in over the past couple of years is making uh, polymers, bio-derived bio polymers. So our role in this is uh, to use renewable feedstocks to make some sort of monomers that polymer scientists can um, polymerize so that uh, they can they can basically get polymers renewably. And then hopefully, uh, if we have the in, if we have interesting enough, complex enough monomers, they can uh, derive new functions from these biopolymers. So um, I do not have much time to share. Uh, our work here, but we try to use basically uh, the tools in this uh, exciting uh, collaboration called Living Biofoundry to synthesize terpenoids that can be polymerized. And we use, uh, we're starting to use this robotic system that can do all the cloning, liquid handling, uh, some basic measurements. Um, and we we're hoping one day we can hook up an LCMS so they can also do analysis, more complex analysis. And then this part is helping us with discovery portion. And then we, we can also scale up using the um, scale, uh, the reactors that's available in the core. So, so basically that's uh, what we are working on. The microbial side of my lab, we work on converting carbon dioxide into acetate. And now we're focusing on uh, converting acetate into a little more complex products. So I, I feel that fatty acids is um, a problem that's pretty well under control. So, uh, other labs have been uh, tackling alkanes and the problems of synthesizing alkanes and terpenoids and polyketides. Uh, I think I, I, you know, I think we have an interesting discovery in terpenoids. So hopefully we can share that with you soon. And uh, in the near future, we are also aiming to use some of these terpenoids products, terpenoid products in producing biopolymers. So uh, with that, I'd like to thank everyone in my group. Uh, we have really hardworking uh, postdocs, graduate students, and undergrad students. And I'd also like to thank these funding sources. And uh, most of all, I'd like to thank everyone here for attending this seminar. And I'd like to thank Taesok and Victor again for their 
kind introduction and kind um, reminder of the history of our synthetic biology field. And uh, if anyone is interested in joining this collaboration of uh, producing biomaterials, combining synthetic biology and uh, polymer science, uh, this is the uh, there's this uh, QR code that you can scan and uh, join the mailing list. And then also these uh, instruments are available to other users outside of UCLA. So it'd be great to see a lot of the users join our co collaboration. Thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Uh, thank you. I, fantastic talk. I mean, you know, I already knew uh, about your work also at the same time. I understand flux analysis and those kind of, you know, modeling effort because of my colleague in my department. But your explanation about, you know, using analogy, cars, traffic, and also river merging together, that is absolutely make everything clear. And now I understand everything, I guess. So, Victor, you know, you have any question, comment, anything? Yeah, well, thank you, first of all. It was a wonderful talk, and um, I enjoyed it thoroughly. So, um, most of your narrative is about what you may call the standard glycolysis, but you hardly mentioned this other um, alternative route, that is the Edner daughter of pathway. So I don't know whether uh, you see also some kind of added values in this other pathway, because my understanding is that uh, in the inner order of pathway, you may have less ATP, but you produce more NADH and NADPH. And therefore, for hosting some stern redox reactions, then um, you know it can be a better pathway than the standard glycolysis. Can you perhaps comment on that? Yes, yeah, that's a great point. So. So the ED pathway, I'm I'm actually skipping a lot of the details here. Yes, so it can be a slightly inferior path pathway compared to the standard glycolysis in terms of ATP because we know that EMP glycolysis in the textbook it uh, it produces two ATP per glucose molecule. This ED pathway produces this this ED pathway produces half as as many. Uh, but yeah, as you mentioned, Victor, yeah, this produces um, NADPH going through this shares partly uh, the first couple of steps of the oxidative pentosphosphate pathway. So it produces NADPH. And also another benefit is that you can see uh, half of the cryoses basically from KDPH splits off directly into pyruvate. And um, you can also kind of count the number of steps in the red arrows. It's also shorter. So if you count the few numbers, fewer numbers of enzymes and you also kind of you know, skip over uh, with the half of the molecule going straight to the end of glycolysis, I think it's, it also has tremendous benefit in terms of enzyme cost. So it, it can get, out, get, get away with fewer enzymes and less amount of proteins to uh, run glycolysis. So those are benefits. And there's been a, there has been a fantastic study, uh, that uh, a theoretical study that showed that these enzyme costs are basically uh, enzyme costs uh, and ATP costs, ATP uh, benefit, basically. Those two are the trade-offs that cells uh, evaluate to decide whether they want to use the EMP pathway or the ED pathway or both. So, um, yeah, so there's there's a lot of interesting things going on in, in the even in glycolysis that we thought we understood pretty well. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm asking you this because, you know, uh, in the case of Pseudomonas putida, uh, it seems that it has a very strong in the of pathway, and that explains to some extent its uh, robustness to host harsh redox reactions. And this is something that perhaps can be extended to other platforms. I don't know, I, 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 but you know, I, I find this pathway quite uh, interesting, even though it has received in general less attention than the standard glycolysis, right? Yeah. So Victor, do you have any other comment or question? Yeah, that's all, thank you. Yeah, thank you. I mean, so my organism, there's a lot of caucus, also very, very high ED pathway flux. And probably, I, be, I don't remember exactly, but 90% ED, but only 10 or less than 10% or EMP. So that is actually an interesting point. So uh, I have one request from audience, Dave. You know, he asked, can you show the... QR code for the mailing list again. That oh. means you probably share that. Yeah. 
Uh, I don't know. Uh, yeah. Oh, uh, here. Yeah. So that means they are very interested in your uh, facility somehow. And yes, I. I'm not a great. I I don't know anything about material science, <laughs> but uh -huh. I think this collaboration is a great opportunity to learn the other side. Uh, from the biological side, I by interacting with the researchers in the Five Pacific MIP, I learn a lot. And for the polymer scientists and material scientists, they learn about the biological side. So I think it's a fantastic opportunity. Mm -hmm. So actually, I'm while waiting other question. I have one. I have multiple questions, but I want to have a quick question because I'm now see only two minutes, but we can chat more after you know the recording session. Uh, my okay. quick question is: You have done multiple amazing uh work, including also even economic analysis. Uh, in that economic analysis, have have you also considered some other factor like you know facility cost, labor cost, more extensive TEA, or that is only based on those kind of the number you just got? Yeah, so that's a great question. So yeah, I haven't considered all the uh, CapEx in, op uh, in operational expenditure. Mm -hmm. But uh, so I think the rule of thumb is something like multiplying the basically the bare bone uh, cost by three right. or so. Uh -huh. So let's see where that slide is. Yeah. So, so I I think yeah. So one 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 aspect of that is yeah. If there if we're only dealing with selling let's say fatty acids, uh -huh. uh, biodiesel, I don't think we're economical. But right. if we have we can if we can also sell yeast, uh, biomass, and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. we have any kind of a CO two credit, then I think we may be in the regime where we're pretty close to you know this dotted line is actually the cost of diesel on the market. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, it can be slightly higher in different states, but I think you know uh, it's a, a good mean average cost. So I think we're pretty close in certain regions. The uh, the dotted regions here vertically are enclosing basically the highest um, yield and highest productivity mm -hmm. uh, that we observed in Morella Thermosetica. I see. I so, see. Yeah. That's that's that's, so, yeah. that's promising. That's great. Yeah. So I, I'm sure there's a lot of challenge associated with it, but mm -hmm. at least I, I feel confident that, you know, we're going the right direction with this uh, type of technology. But that's wonderful. Actually, the reason I asked that question is now, you know, compared to the last 10 years, I'm now more interested in translation. So I'm forming a yeah. company. So I keep asking about my process, whether that's economical, and then I did lots of TA analysis myself. And that's why I'm yeah. asking. So, so let me check whether we have another question from audience. Okay. Uh, you know, so in that case, I'm I will close and then we will have the informal session. So uh thank all for joining and staying today. We'll meet again on April 6th, Thursday, the same time, the same Zoom link, but different time zone for me while. Actually, I'm the, in Germany. And we'll have Dr. Nathan Hilson from Joint Bioenergy Institute, JBay, and Mr. Uh, Logan uh, Collins from Moshu. As usual, the follow-up informal chat will occur without recording. Please stay here if you are interested in chatting with today's speakers. I will promote you to panelists who can speak and show your handsome and pretty face if you wish. And thanks, I'm stop recording. Just give me one second.